What's up guys, it's your local Realized man, Isaac, checking in on the Realized steps in the Realized backyard. Today I've got something a little bit different. I did an interview with my friend, my good friend Oliver, from the channel Outsider's Perspective. And this guy is a wealth of knowledge. He's been doing these videos every single day, these daily bread videos where he kind of gives you um, kind of his take on some of these big philosophical questions on how to live a better life or how we should approach our lives. And I tune in all the time and I learn so much from his videos and I think you guys should check out his channel. I'm gonna put a link in the description, a link everywhere. And um, enjoy our conversation. We'll go deep into stoicism and all sorts of crazy shit. I'll timestamp everything down below so you can skip to the relevant bits that you need. Anyway guys, enjoy. What I really want to talk to you about, Isaac, is, first of all, how do I say your last name? Because I butcher people's names like it's my favorite thing to do. <laughs> Chana Kira. Oh, just like it's spelled. Yeah. How convenient. Very convenient. <laughs> Isaac Chana Kira. Yeah, that's it. Excellent. Awesome. Uh, so why don't you start off by telling me a little bit about sort of where you stumbled upon, I'm assuming, either Stoke philosophy or, or just self-actualization and that sort of concept? Um, yeah, well, it's a long story. Um, basically, funny enough, I started off by trying to, I'm not sure if you know about, know about the pickup community, game community, picking up women. That's what I was into when I was younger, was I thought, you know, like a lot of young males think that, you know, once I get the girl, that'll be it. Once I get this, that'll be it. So I stumbled across this particular um, channel, which was RSD Tyler. And the whole premise of that channel was in order to attract women, you first need to work on yourself. You first need to become a better man. So you should read about these things. You should meditate and all these things. And I'm grateful because of that, because it actually led me into the self-actualization stuff. So I quit the pickup stuff. I didn't really get too far into that. I was more interested in the actual self-improvement aspect of it. And that's how I stumbled across stoicism, you know, mindfulness, and all these different concepts which you kind of bump into inevitably once you go down this road and everything changed from there. Nice. So how old were you when you sort of uh, discovered this particular channel that, that put you onto stoicism and all these other things? Around 17 years old, I started. Wow. 18 is when I really started getting more into it. And I'm almost 23 now, so it's been a while. Yeah, good for you, man. It's rare to find early starters in this kind of stuff, I find. It's changing, though. The, the Internet's created a strange dynamic where now I'm seeing 15-year-olds talking about stoicism, 15-year-olds nice. meditating, you know, working on all these things that take some people a lifetime to really get into. I think it's because everyone's connected now. It's a lot easier to find this information. People are now questioning their beliefs and the information is readily available. You know what I mean? So it's yeah. changed the dynamic, dynamic big time. So, so how long did you sort of uh, go doing this before you started making your own, your own content to sort of, cause I mean, you're right. It, it's all about the internet and access to information and then people like yourself who are going out there, taking the time in your own private life to make content, to spread the word, because obviously it had a positive impact on you and you want to pay it forward. Right? Yeah. Yeah, well, well, in regards to making my YouTube videos and my blog and stuff like that, it started off as um, I naturally I'd read these things and be inspired by it and I would explain to my friends these concepts and other people I knew. And then I figured, you know what, why not make this into like a platform or make a video about it or make a blog post about it so that I can, instead of having to explain the same thing over and over again, I could just be like, yo, look, I've written this blog post about it. I'll link you it. And that way, Will kind of affect more people yeah i never imagined it to actually get to the scale where it's at now so that's how that started and that's awesome wow. yeah no doubt so you you got into that sort of uh into blogging and then video making after was that sort of the order you did it in yeah yeah awesome. i did the blogging first but i enjoyed writing but my punctuation and grammar was like terrible so <laughs> i figured <laughs> i figured i'll just get a camera and start talking and if you actually go back, I've got my um, first videos still up on the channel and they were incredibly awkward and you know, <laughs> stifled. And, but I just kept persisting with it and naturally yeah. getting better with it. And like such as yourself, I've seen your videos now. You, you've done quite a few now and they're getting better and better each time too. 
Yeah, well, I'm trying to just do uh, quantity over quality at this point. <laughs> I'm just trying to put it out there. You know what I mean? Same as you, right? Like, uh, very similar stories, right? Like, I, I have friends who who know about my obsessions and who uh, some of them are interested. And so it's mostly my friends and, and the, who are interested who watch these videos. But for the same purpose, I, I started making them because I figured... I talk about this stuff all the time. People have asked me questions a ton. So maybe I can just direct them to these little, you know, five minute videos that are just me sitting, you know, driving my car on my way to work and yeah. make a quick little, you know, comments or whatever. So, but, uh, but yeah, same as you, like people are interested and I didn't realize they were getting interested at 15, which is great news. I think. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's very strange. Like I was thinking about it the other day as the world changes, as the technology advances, as distractions and stuff like that keep coming up, you think that all hope is lost for humanity, but the same force that's causing these distractions and this like lack of awareness is also helping people, you know, get connected. The same technology is helping people learn about meditation, all these things. So it's an interesting dynamic. I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. It is really interesting. You're, and you're right. Like the sort of, I think the state of the world, the, the negative aspects of it are also contributing to this sort of new renewed interest in ancient philosophies and spirituality because yeah. people feel like sort of like yourself as a young man trying to pick up chicks. You know, once I get the hot girls, I'm going to be good. Once I get the job, the house, you know, whatever, there's always something. Yeah. Once I get the, I think people are realizing faster and faster now that once you get the thing, there's just another thing. And so they're looking yeah. for something more, right? Yeah. A hundred percent, especially now that things that like I, I heard this um point that someone made right now, the average person is living at a higher standard than what a king used to live at. Yeah. Right? You've got water, you can drive down the street, get like whatever food you want. You can prepare all these things. You can, you know, your life is not that bad, right? You, you're going to live to at least 80 or something biting, you know, nothing crazy happens. So all these things are happening and people are still like feeling that sense of, you know, that thing inside that just not at peace. So I think that's why people are getting back into these ancient philosophies and stuff like that, like what you pointed out before. Yeah. Yeah. So did you feel that as a young man at like 17, did you kind of feel that thing that you just mentioned, which is hard to put into words, the void or whatever you want to call it? <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I started feeling that in, as I started getting some of these things and started reading about these things, it started all clicking because it was always something. It was always something. You, you get something, you feel happy for the moment or for a week or two, and then that goes away. And you say, okay, it's the next thing. You get that, you feel happy for a bit, that goes away. It's the next thing. And it gets to a point where you have to start questioning at what point is it going to end? Is it going to end when I make a million dollars? Is it going to end when I make $2 million? Like, but then you also observe people that made that money. Yeah. And like recently, um, um, the guy, the lead singer of Linkin Park passed away too. And that mm -hmm. was a big surprise to a lot of people. And it just goes to show you that these material things that everyone's kind of fixated about, they're always telling you are going to make you happy. Don't really make you happy. These girls, these drugs, they, there's something deeper than that. Yeah. And, and sometimes I find like, the, like, so you talk about the material things, but a lot of the times they're not even really material. They're abstract, like fame. Fame is not yeah. material. It's abstract. It's a it's a concept, and it's fickle too, right? I mean, one day you're famous, the next day you're a bum. You're yeah. fucking <laughs> making movies with B-list actors, and nobody knows who you are anymore. And so, yeah, you're right. People are looking for something. I assume that's more permanent, mm. more reliable, right? Because all these things that we've been sort of conditioned to chase, as you said, they're they're very temporary and there's always an, a bigger one or a, a nicer one waiting for you around the corner so yeah it's fucked up isn't it <laughs> <laughs> we have it better than any generation you're right dude so i recently got diagnosed with gout which i thought by the way didn't exist anymore i thought it was like 16th century monarchs got this this kind of condition right i i could take a pill and it just goes away in 48 hours there are like kings in, in France who like died from gout. Like they couldn't move anymore. Their joints were all like gnarled. Yeah. And they just, you know? But you're so, it's so, so funny that you say that we do, we live the, like the poorest West Westerner lives in better conditions than like a monarch from yeah. you know, a couple hundred years ago. Yeah. Like, 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 for example, people are always talking about, 
like the biggest problem that people have these days is that they've got you know like this phone or something they don't have the iphone 10 like oh I'm, I'm so poor i can't afford the iphone 10 you go back like 50 years and you're literally a magician if you have something like this you're like some kind of freaking superstar or something you know what i mean yeah and, yeah the answer to every question in the palm of your hand basically yeah but someone told me it's about relativity that people don't really care about um actual wealth it's about relative wealth yeah about the sense of being better than other people or something like that that's what better than you were before right better yeah. better shape than you were so for like for a person like me i always use the example like if i if i made a million dollars tomorrow i'd be I'd be thrilled. I'd be like, that's the most money I've ever seen in my entire life. Um, but if you take the same outcome, which is a million dollars, but you start at 10. So let's pretend I have $10 million today and tomorrow I lose nine of it and I'm down to 1 million, exact same amount of wealth. But because I started at 10 in the second scenario, I'm fucking angry now. I made, I lost so much money. Oh my God. Yeah. It's it's, um, money, it's, yeah, it's crazy. Uh, that's a tendency um, for us to, Put a bigger emphasis on the loss, the negative, than the gain. I think I believe it's actually a cognitive bias, loss aversion, cognitive bias, yep. and yeah, it's, it's strange how the mind naturally. I'm not sure if it's natural or if it's conditioned. Kind of operates in a way to observe the negative or observe what you don't have. Yes, or place more importance on it, more emphasis on it than than yeah. you. Yeah, and it. So, have you found that it required retraining yourself to sort of shift the emphasis? Because I'm assuming you're you're not always focused on the negative. You seem like you're a pretty uh, positive, upbeat, and optimal kind of guy. So, did it take you a long time to retrain yourself? It took. I'm still I'm still learning. I'm still I'm still working on it. It's it's a lot of work. It's not something that happens overnight. Because I'm sure as you've read, you've read a lot of texts and stuff on this search of, you know, improving yourself. Understanding a concept objectively doesn't mean that you truly embody it. You know, like you might read something, it doesn't really mean that you understand it. You have to really experience it. You have to um, reflect on it. So it's an ongoing process. It's kind of like how when you read about meditation and Buddhism and stuff, there's this concept that comes up that, we're all one, you know, we're all connected. And I can understand that on a logical plane, right? I understand that logically it makes sense to me when they break it down, you look at it, but I'm not at that stage where I feel it. So I still have those moments of ego. I still have those moments of, you know, I'm the main person, I'm, I'm the one. So yes. yeah. with every concept, it takes time for you to really gain the wisdom, not just the knowledge. There's a big difference between the two. Yeah, totally agree. Yeah, and, and you're right. I mean, it's one thing to understand something intellectually, like, yeah, it makes logical sense, you know, space is an illusion, we're all part of the same universe, we're all connected, yada, yada, yada. But to feel that and to experience the truth of it is a whole nother dimension. <laughs> yeah, it, it takes time, it takes a lot of self work. Yeah. And that's something I'm working on every single day. And that, that's kind of part of the reason that I made the channel too, to kind of not just teach people that are on the journey, but also show my progress as well. So that when people look at it, they might be able to watch videos that I made, you know, a couple of years ago and say, Oh, Isaac was making these videos and in the future, like, wow, look at the progression. Okay. He's made that progression. I can make that progression. Right. Well, and it's good for you to see as well. I imagine. Yeah. It's, 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 it's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, cause I think it's too easy to lose sight of the progress that you made and then to again, revert back to, fixating on your shortcomings or your failures. So, you know, five years ago, I was a really angry guy, mm. always lost my temper. Now I lose my temper, maybe one tenth of the amount of time. But if I don't remember how, where I started, every time I lose my temper now, it might be a lot less, but I will still get frustrated with myself for, for a shortcoming. Right. So it's good to exactly. see the progress and where you started to keep things in perspective. Exactly, man. Like you always got to reflect on that. It's crazy. Yeah. Well, that's, dude, I'm, I'm super impressed that you started this stuff at 17. Not impressed even, like, I'm so happy for you. Because you've got such <laughs> an advantage going into your 30s, man. You're like, I figured this shit out in my 30s. You're already there. It's like, pff, just keep going. You're crushing yeah. it. Uh, yeah, I, I hear that a lot. But at the same time, whenever people tell me, tell me these things and they're like, Oh, bro, I'm impressed by your mindset. Oh, you, you know, you're crazy. This is amazing. What I always reflect them is that I'm human and it's more, it's nothing 
from my side, it's more luck and circumstances that brought me to where I am. Mm -hmm. Some people that you see in a negative light, let's say like a drug addict or someone who behaves negatively, it's, it's not always their fault. It's a lot of the times the circumstances, what they were taught, what they were brought up with. So I was lucky enough to be in a position where all the cards fell in place, all the variables came together for me to see these insights, start making videos, and be where I'm at. So it's a blessing. I just had luck and yeah. Yeah, but you had to be in the right headspace. I mean, like, yeah, the, the conditions were right, but the conditions are right for millions of people and they don't all follow your path. You know what I'm saying? That so, is, is point and I, you know, it's funny what you say. Like, I work with people who are, who've been re released from uh, federal penitentiary. Okay. And um, so I've, like, gotten close to a number of these people that are just, you know, either they've just came out or, um, this one guy that I'm, I'm mentoring now, he's been out for over a year and he's doing awesome, but he, he had a rough, not a rough life, but you know, he had a, a sort of rough and tumble uh, upbringing and the beginning of his life was pretty rough and he went in, you know, for 14 years. But while he was inside, he had one of these sort of like turnaround moments. And now he's like, he's like you, he's like, you know, when you talk to him, it's like, he's never read Stoic philosophy. He's never, mm. you know, done any of this stuff, but he embodies it as much as anybody who practices it consciously. Yeah. So even though he didn't have the circumstances, he still found his way there. It's a path that's available to everyone. I think yeah. if, but you have to be ready for it or you have to be open for it, I guess, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. yeah. Well, what I'm trying to do with the channel is I'm trying to invite people to get into that frame of mind in a safe way, like just over time and get it and embody it and not have them, have to attain it by force because sometimes people have to attain by force as in like some circumstance in life happens yeah. to get cancer from a bad diet or you know something tragic happens that forces it literally shakes them to question their beliefs to question how they've been living so I, hopefully it doesn't have to get that way from my subscribers and my viewers and that they yeah. can just choose consciously to change their life yeah you're right and that's a common story isn't it the dark night of the soul people go through some oh, traumatic yeah. crazy you know period of time where it just destroys them and sometimes you need to be destroyed before you can rebuild yourself i guess that's true that is so true not the best way to do it though <laughs> yeah no no no. it's much better to make a conscious choice and actually work towards it but yeah, there's so many abstractions that are preventing people from getting to that. Like, if you go on YouTube right now, the most popular channel would be, you know, some random twerking video or something like that, or, you know, some <laughs> some prank video. It's not going to be your channel or my channel. So that's something I've kind of accepted before I made the channel. I knew that, sure, I could gain some success in the channel, but this is not a path for, you know, extreme entrepreneurship glory, you know, like... Yeah. Only a niche group of people are going to be into this type of content. But I'm very happy with it because what it's done is it's created an environment for me to talk to like-minded people and to get ideas. So it's kind of, I mean, it's like selfless and selfish. It's selfish mm -hmm. in the sense that I gain a lot from the people I'm around now. Like, for example, you and me talking right now in your channel. I gain a lot of perspectives just watching your daily bread videos, things I would have never probably stumbled across. I was just like watch one of your videos and go, oh, damn okay that, that's interesting yeah. and that impacts the actions i make today and who knows how much i trickled down five years down the line just that one choice of watching one of your videos that changed something yeah yeah you're right and i've noticed that too like with you philip um and then a couple other people that i've sort of met through youtube but other uh, other content creators um you definitely sort of build these little relationships that uh, are positive for everybody involved. Like you said, you yeah. benefit, I benefit, um, and it's a win-win, which is beautiful. That's the best yeah, yeah. situation. Yeah. Uh, so like what, what's your, what was your earlier life like, uh, before you sort of came onto this stuff? Like, are you, I, you know, without using too many generic labels, like were you middle class? Were you, you know, like what was your life situation where you, what do your parents do? What's your sort of background? Well, it's actually interesting. I, I kind of grew up lucky in the sense that my, my dad, my parents were from Zimbabwe. I'm from Zimbabwe in Africa, yeah. right? And they grew up poor. So for them growing up, um, education was like a very big thing. It was a very big thing. It was the way out 
So my dad is a very smart guy. You know, he did the whole education thing, did the whole grind thing, and managed to get out of the country and start something new over here. So growing up over here, I had like a fresh start in this new country. I came here when I was five. And he kept telling me about the need to educate yourself, you know, to gain knowledge, to read books when I was younger as a sense, as a way to kind of distinguish yourself and make it out. But it was more of a like making money type frame. But back then I wasn't really interested in that. I didn't really give a shit. I was more into skateboarding when I was younger. Of course. But as I don't know why, but as I got older, as I started getting to around 16, 17, some of those things he was telling me started kicking in. Mm -hmm. So I, that's how I got into self improvement as well with the game thing and the reading. Cause he was always reading. I saw these, saw these books around the house. So that was a big influence in how I actually got into this stuff as well. My dad. So that, that also kind of helps with what I was saying before about how it's luck. Cause you don't choose your parents. I could have easily had a different father who was, you know, not about any of that stuff. And I can imagine it would have been much more difficult for me to pick up a book. Hmm. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, even with, when, even when you have parents who are encouraging you to read, I think it's hard to pick up a book. So yeah, I mean, if you don't, if your parents don't care, they don't do any effort to get you to open a book, then you're uh, mm -hmm. going uphill. <laughs> yeah, but I didn't grow up in any crazy circumstances that forced me to really embody this. Luckily, it was more of a conscious choice on my behalf more of a realization that, look, this is life, you know, it moves so fucking fast. <laughs> and who knows what's going to happen after this life? All I do know for a fact is that I'm here right now in this life. So why don't I make something of it? And the way I'm going to make something of it is by working on myself, by meditating, by reading all these things and trying to get to the bottom of these, you know, concepts. And that's where we're at now. Nice. So are you kind of like building a, a repertoire of different things? Because obviously you're not just reading one uh, tradition or one discipline. You branched out. You, I mean, I, I think the first video I saw of yours was James Allen. I think that's pretty, pretty sure that's how I caught wind of you. And I was yeah. like, oh, I like this guy. I like this guy, you know? Yeah. As a man oh, thinking. That. Yeah, that's because that's kind of an obscure one. I mean, not a lot of people know about that one. And I remember reading that one early on in my process and being blown away by it. It was uh, like game changer for me. A wonderful book, wonderful book. No, no, well, I stumbled across these things because my whole thing, what I realized at a young age was what's going to determine the quality of your life is your mind, right? Like how your mind operates. Like how, how you, you can have two people in the same circumstances. Like I heard this story, I'm not sure where I heard it from, but basically, um, just to kind of put some context on what I'm saying here, there's two twins, right? Two twin boys, and they have a father. A single father was taking care of them. Now, this father is working like two jobs and, you know, he's working really hard to take care of them, but he just can't seem to pay off the bills. He can't, he can't keep up. He finally decides that in order to pay the bills and take care of these kids, he's going to have to resort to like a life of crime. So he gangs up with some of the people in his neighborhood and they decide to rob a bank. Makes this money, right? So as he's robbing his bank, um, you know, things go astray and they end up killing the clerk and when they get out the money, they get arrested and they go to jail. So the two twins now go into an orphanage. A couple years later, some guy doing a documentary goes up to these two twins and he wants to see like what effect having a bad upbringing had on these kids. One of the twins was in jail. You know, he was a criminal, just like the dad doing all these crimes. The other twin was, you know, a successful businessman, respected in the community, complete opposite. And he asked them, he's like, why did your life turn out the way it did? And then the twins said, both of them replied the same thing. They said, with a father like that, how could I have been anything different? Whoa. <laughs> uh, yeah. Your perspective, your mind is going to determine where you're going to get at. It's not about your circumstances. That's why I fell in love so much with stoicism, because it was all these things I was thinking of, and it was just written, you know, like it's just written so nicely, so concise, so poetically. And it was like thousands of years ago. That's why I fell in love with stoicism, was embodies that. So my whole concept with my channel is, okay, we have our mind, what mechanisms um, does our mind play? What cognitive biases do we have? What mannerisms, like what's the ego? So I'm really trying to 
understand that so I can help people overcome their minds. Because once you unlock the mind, everything else is easy. Building that goal physique is easy. You know, sticking on your diet is easy. Making that money is easy. You know, everything else is easy once you can master your mind. Yeah. Yeah, it's very true. Yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? Because it's the one thing that it's kind of like the the story about the two the two school fish who are swimming off to school and then the old fish comes the other way and goes, hey, lads, how's the water? And then the two fish keep swimming and they're like, what's water? <laughs> yeah. like the mind is like that. It's so yeah. we're in it where I'm in it right now. You're in yours, you know, whatever. Yeah. We're constantly swimming in the mind and we don't realize it. It's the one thing we don't pay any attention to. And it's the most primary and most important foundational thing that you have any control mm -hmm. over really. So, yeah. but it, I almost feel like it's a conspiracy, Isaac. What do you think? Do you think it's a conspiracy that like the, the education system doesn't talk about this oh. stuff? <laughs> Come on, man. It's almost like they want to keep us in the matrix. I don't know, man. You're going to get us arrested, man, with all this talk, man. <laughs> What's that? What's that? You're going to get us arrested with this talk, man. <laughs> Listen, you realize, man. man. <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't think it's deliberate. It is. It is. It, it is a conspiracy, 100%. If you, if you really think about it, like someone was telling me that, you know, like the education system, they don't even teach you about your basic human rights. They teach you about these abstract things that you think are education, you know, like Pythag Pythagoras theorem, some, some things about history and yeah. random shit that no one really uses. <laughs> you spend a lot of time on Pythagoras theorem. How much of the population is going to use Pythagoras theorem? Yeah. How much of the population is going to use calculus? And I'm, I'm dude, like, I'm a freaking engineering student. I got this mechanical engineering math book here and I'm talking shit about it. So <laughs> yeah. that's hilarious. Oh man. Yeah. Like I, you know what? It's funny that you say that you're right. Not very many people use it, but there are people who do use it. Um, yeah. And it's funny cause I made that exact argument to a friend of mine and he's a cabinet maker and he's like, Oh dude, pi, I use pi all the time. Pythagoras. Like, you know, if you're a carpenter, you're doing a roof. The roof pitch is, is Pythagoras. Yeah. It's triangles. But you're, you know, for the most part, you don't use it and the people who do use it they have to relearn it because they guess what they didn't retain it in school they yeah. didn't pay any fucking attention to that stuff because they thought it was useless at the time yeah. so it's yeah i don't know man you know i dream of a day where people can start as early as you all the time because it's part of the education system you know like it's just yeah. something that you start doing in school when you're in elementary school like the art of living or you know philosophy or just basic yeah. sort of it's like the video you made. You made you made a video. Um, I think it was today or yesterday, about a uh, Masunius Rufus. Mm, yeah, yeah. Quote about embodying your philosophy and not just you know teaching it or talking about it. A philosophy yeah. should be something that you embody. It's the same with the school thing. The education system it shouldn't just be something where they teach you random facts or you know about Louis the whatever in France. It needs to be. To help you live yes you know, like so they should have things in their curriculum like how to deal with your emotions you know like how to have a conversation with some a crucial conversation where you're both talking without ego and you can get to a resolution they don't teach these things but these are the fundamental aspects of living because you're gonna have to have conversations with people you're gonna have to deal with your emotions you're gonna have to stop procrastination but all these things are just omitted it's very like myopic you know the way they teach agreed well, I think the system was uh, built for or it evolved during an era that's vastly different from our own, right? The industrial age. Yeah. How much yeah, education yeah, did yeah. you need back then, right? I mean, and the things that they taught you were important at the time, but now, unfortunately, uh, the system hasn't evolved with the, the culture and the technology, right? No, it hasn't. But I have a, my um, idea, my, the reason I think it's like that, it stayed like that, is because there's just too much money being made from it. Because the education system, you go to school and it leads you right to like in America college, in other countries, university, which is an outdated system for the most part. For some degrees, it's necessary, like engineering. I'm going to yeah. say you do need to, you know, go to uni and stuff like that. But for some things, it's not even needed anymore. There's just so much information out there mm -hmm. on the internet and there's better ways of doing it. But because it's already been established and they're making so much money from it, it's not going to go away anytime soon. That's how things go. Like old systems are going to stay until they have to crumble, until there is that much force opposing it. Yeah, until we grab sledgehammers. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Yeah, no, I agree. So, so what, how many more years of, of uh, university do you have left, Isaac? I've got one more year left of this degree and then I am done. Nice. You don't sound certain. Nah. <laughs> nah, it's one more. Assuming everything goes, everything goes all right. Right. So things and if I don't fail anything, and yeah, you should be all good. Right. All right, cool. Uh, are you are you excited to get out of school, or do you, do you think you're going to miss it, or a combination of both? I'm not going to miss it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is, going into this degree, I was a very different person to who I am now. Right. I, I started when I was 18. I was still like the reason I got into mechanical engineering specifically is because I was always good at math, physics, and stuff like that. And at this stage, I could still do it. It's not a big passion, but it's a, it's just a job, you know? Yeah. So that's how I feel about it at the moment. It's, it doesn't call to me like this other stuff does. It doesn't seem, you know. Yeah. But this other stuff, if you had gone that route in university, say with philosophy or, or psychology, I don't think you'd be making videos right now. I don't think you'd be into it. You'd probably think it's stupid. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, my girlfriend actually does psychology and she says it's, not what you think <laughs> it's, it's oh. the same with philosophy like what you say a lot of philosophy is just you know studying other philosophy it's not asking those deep questions it's not no it's not it's not um like you know the republic but plato or something you know it's not it's well not you, you might you might study that in your philosophy class but whatever you get out of it is not going to be of practical use to you in life you're not going to be able to walk out and say oh, i learned something really useful in plato's republic today in my philosophy 201 class you know it's all detached and it, from reality in such a way that you can't really use it and it's not even packaged in a way that you can think you you, you can't even imagine how you would use it you know what i mean like I took a, an introductory philosophy class my first year and they threw Descartes at us the first thing, brain in a vat. It's like, that is a, an important sort of part of philosophy. And I think that whole sort of uh, dialogue that he has with himself about how do I know I'm, I'm really real? How do I know I'm not a brain in a fucking jar? I think that's an important concept now. But at the time, my professor made no effort to make it practical or entertaining or or yeah. or captivating in any way so for me it was just like this stupid sort of thought experiment and i couldn't see the point of it i thought it was the dumbest thing yeah that's the thing a lot of people don't meet people at that level they kind of just talk assuming everyone's at the same level yeah so instead of yeah. starting off at where someone would be and building up and letting them gain a great appreciation of some things they just whatever you know that, that's kind of like part of the reason i enjoyed high school so much i had this really good teacher right i I um, used to hate English, used to hate it, it's terrible at it. But I had this really good teacher that made Shakespeare cool, like Hamlet cool, that yeah. made poetry cool, you know, just made you question things. Like I remember he was um, asking everyone in the class back in year 11, so this is 2012, I think. He's asking everyone in the class, oh, so what religion are you? What, what religion do you follow? And then he was asking, oh, why do you follow that? And at the time I was thinking, wow, this guy's an asshole, man. Like. Why is he asking students what religion they are? Like, why is he questioning people? That, that's terrible. But now I kind of look back and I'm like, wow, this guy was actually trying to get us to think, right? Because a lot yeah. of us were brought up in whatever, like just given some beliefs, whatever religion, and you, that's all you know. And you never question it. You never think about well, what if these, these other religions are right? What if this other spirituality path is right? And he kind of planted that seed. I always ask people, like, um, whenever I talk to um like I'm, I'm not i'm not against any religion i'm not atheist or anything like that but whenever i talk to someone of a particular religion i ask them it's like why do you follow that religion like if i talk to a christian uh, why do you follow that religion when i talk to a muslim why do you follow the religion and they just tell me oh yeah because this 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 and i'm like but have you looked at these other religions right and they're like oh no nah, they're wrong you know <laughs> i'm like but have you have you read i asked a christian have you read the quran they're like, they're like oh you yeah, know nah, have you have you looked at it or you ask a muslim have you read this so you know like no one's looking outside their tunnel vision yeah and that's something i always invite people to do is like don't be so close-minded don't just adapt something wrong with it you should always be questioning yourself questioning what you believe questioning what you've done in the past or what's true what, what did um socrates say unexamined life is not worth living or something like that yeah yeah very true words to live by i think but often that's the last thing we want to examine 
is our own life, right? Yeah. Because who knows what we're going to find there. (laughs) It's too painful to examine. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, exactly. And you know, like you talked about the ego earlier, it's one of those things that it's a, the ego is a fragile, fragile construct. It's a house of glass, you know, just ready to shatter at the merest, you know, flick. So people are, if they think they're their ego, if I think I'm my ego, I don't want to go and poke around in there because what if I break the whole thing, you know? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Oh, man. I feel like that's why, um, you know, things like Netflix and all these other things are so popular because they provide distraction from asking these deeper questions. Instead of reading about Seneca on the shortness of life and contemplating time and life, and if life is short, you'd rather watch The Real Housewives of Atlanta and see what, you know, Shanae or whatever is doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah it's much easier you know it's 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 much easier you deal you deal with your death when it comes so yeah like deal with it when yeah. you have to but for but now I, we can have fun <laughs> yeah exactly watch your binge watch your shows and uh don't ask too many questions right <laughs> yeah. it's funny because like you mentioned death i think that's that's a pretty big one isn't it like mm. What's your view on death? Have you sort of, have you managed to overcome your sort of instinctual fear of it? Do you have any hope for what comes after death? Or is it just kind of like something that is in the future and you'll deal with it when you get there? I've, I feel like I've come to terms with it, or at least my own. Like I've come to terms with the fact that, you know, one day I will die. One day, you know, life will end. But I don't have any negative associations with it in the sense of not, not to be like, you know, bleak or dark or anything, but in the sense that you kind of need death in order to bring meaning to life. Cause I've had the thought experiment where I thought, okay, what would happen if death was a concept that didn't exist, right? Let's say death didn't exist. And I could just live forever and ever and ever and ever. Would I be excited to make these videos? Would I be excited to do anything? Would I be excited to work with, I do anything or I just lie in bed the whole day because it's like, who cares? Like, I'm going to live forever. Do I need to do anything? Like, I'll do, I'll do something in the next 200,000 years, you know? Like, I got so much time on my hands. So I feel like it's necessary in the um, sense that, yeah, it does bring meaning to life. And in about what happens after death, I don't spend too much time speculating about it because to me, I feel like I'll never know. I'll never know until... I get that. So whatever, you know, things I come up with is kind of mental masturbation. Yeah. And why not make the most of what I do know exists, which is now, yeah. which is life. The, the death question is like, another thing I want to throw at you is everyone's always asking what happens after death. You, you, people are so worried about what happens after death. You weren't concerned about what happened before you were alive. You don't think about that. That didn't bother you the slightest bit. So why should death bother you? And it's the same thing before life, after life. I mean, it's not life. So it's death, right? I mean, it's like you said, they sort of define each other and complete each other. It's hard to have one without the other, right? Yeah. I like what you said about not worrying too much about what comes after, because I think that's something that, you know, you mentioned other religious groups, uh, you know, I kind of chuckle at the ones that are really, really focused on the afterlife because we know we're alive now. Like yeah. I'm certain of that, I'm pretty certain anyways, uh, but I have no clue what's going to come later. So why would I spend so much time fixating on what may come or what may not even happen uh, when life is right here in front of me? So it's, but a lot of religious groups are focused on that. A lot of, you know, like the Jehovah's Witnesses, for example, they're, they're eager for the end. They want this system to end. And it's like that. You guys are, are eager for that. Like that, that doesn't sound like fun at all to me. Yeah, well, well, what I feel like is a lot of religions, I'm not pointing out any particular religion, particular, but a lot of religions um, kind of give people a, something easy to understand. You know, it's like, just believe in this, just believe in this particular concept, just believe in that and you'd be all good. Mm-hmm. And that kind of eliminates those other questions that we were talking about before. So you don't have to worry about that. Yeah. And, and you can worry about just focusing on what you've been told to do. And when you die, everything will be all good. Mm-hmm. And if you really, if you put all your heart into it, life is a lot easier, right? But if you choose to question that, if you choose to go against that, there's discomfort because you don't have numbers on your side. You don't have 
the social proof that comes with religion, other people that believe it, you know, millions of other people, the, the churches or the mosques or anything, you're on your own just dealing with these questions and that could be a very scary thing. That could be existential crisis one-on-one. Mm. So that, that's what I think. Yeah, that's a good point. There is comfort in having a bunch of people right next to you who believe the same thing as you. It gives you sort of a sense of uh, confidence and certainty, right? Whereas if it's just me, I believe that, you know, I'm going to get resurrected as an elephant god. Um, you know, it's just one crazy dude saying something. But if there's millions of us who are saying it, then it becomes Legit. more likely, or at least in my mind, it's more likely. <laughs> you know, what I think is, um, like, I, I, never look at, I never look at religion besides maybe Scientology and just think like, nah, you know, like whatever. <laughs> I, I feel like there's merits in everything. There's yeah. essence of truth in everything. If you look at every religion, there's certain pieces of gold. But mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of religions with the translations and, you know, the politics and stuff like that, some of the things get misinterpreted and changed over the years and people, you know, end up doing all sorts of crazy shit. Yeah. So, well, and the best part about crazy shit is if you want to do it, you can justify it any fucking way you want. It could be oh, yeah. a religious system. It could be a political system. It could just be the voice in your head told you to do it. That's the best part about crazy people and crazy shit, right? I mean, it's easy to justify. So, um, I mean, yeah. the mind boggling thing to me, like case in point is like the, the sort of Christian conservatives, the fundamentalist ones. It's almost like they took all the things that Jesus said and they were like, let's do the opposite. And then let's still say that we follow Christ. And it's like, you guys didn't read it. Like, just read the book at least. Come on. Yeah. Do you have, do you have a lot? Do you have that sort of fundamentalist conservative um, strain in Australia? I, I, I intrigued by your culture because I know it's probably quite similar to Canadian culture and American culture in some degree. But what are the sort of unique uh, segments of the population that I wouldn't find in Canada here? I don't know, Australia is kind of multicultural and yeah, you do get some of those, but not as much, I don't think, as in other countries, just because this country's only got 22 million people. You know, you go overseas to America and Canada where you have like, what, close to hundreds of millions of people. Well, I think Canada's 30 million, but... Oh, really? Yeah, it's small. We're pretty, I mean, we're, we're big, but we don't have a lot of people. We're spread what? out. What? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're small, dude. We're very, well, and I gotta look it up. I don't even know how many people in my own no, country. No, no way, Canada has thirty million. America's like three hundred fifty million. They're way. Oh yeah, no, they're we're way, way, way smaller than than the U.S. I gotta look it up now. But I'm listening to you. I just gotta find this. Is it too cold up there or something? It, well, yeah, and, and like we have a lot of real estate, but it's mostly just empty flat lands. Like the center of Canada is just you can drive for four days, and it's all it is is fields and polar bears. Are they polar bears? Yeah, and igloos. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't say Australia has, yeah, a lot of that stuff. It's, it's, it's a relatively new country, you know? Right. People are trying to find its way. So it's not like America, we have these, you know, crazy distinct groups. Right. A lot of stark divisions in, in the U.S., hey? I mean, it's it's quite like the divides are, are very clear and very... Um, it's like most people fall, they're either this or they're that. They're, there's not a lot of people who are just kind of in the middle who are like, oh, you know, it's like you, you got to pick a color, right? You got to <laughs> be one or the other. Guns or no guns. <laughs> you got to be one, choose a team. <laughs> well, see, I like personally, have you ever seen the Chris Rock uh, skit about uh, gun control? Uh, no. What, what, what are you saying? Then? Well, he says like, but guns are not the issue. You don't need to have gun control. You need bullet control. And he says, you, you start charging five grand for one bullet, nobody's ever going to get accidentally shot again. Oh, Somebody shit. gets shot, that motherfucker earned it because it's five grand for one bullet. <laughs> Damn. Uh, 36.29 million people in Canada. That blows my mind. That's crazy. 24, 24 million in your country. Yeah. So get this. There's more people in California than there is in my entire country. In one state, there's more people than in my entire nation. That's, that's, that's because California knows how to party. They do. Yes. <laughs> they certainly do. Uh, so that's interesting. 
So when I when I talked to you about uh, potentially bringing up politics, you said you didn't know anything about U.S. politics. But what about Australian politics? Are you sort of are you active? Do you vote? Do you care? Yeah, do you care? I, I do vote. Like the biggest issue in Australian politics at the moment is gay marriage and if they should have gay marriage. Funny enough, um, they had the vote recently whether um they should um have gay marriage or that should be like an issue that's brought up and 66 percent of the people voted yes yeah which was actually surprising to me because not that i'm against or anything but i thought people were still very fundamental fundamentalist just a couple of years ago people were like no like fuck no but wow. now it's like changing it's like so it's progressive interesting that quick eh? in a few years the sort of tide turned and people were like meh People are like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> it's interesting how things happen like that. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think, you know, again, if, you, if you're able to think logically about issues, like I, there are certain issues, political, legal issues, that uh, I don't have a horse in the race. For instance, um, like decriminalizing drugs. I don't mm. shoot heroin. I don't, you know, snort coke. For me, I don't, it doesn't affect me personally. But I think that if you look at the issue logically and if you look at countries that have decriminalized, it's, it's better overall. I think it's just that you look at the evidence without thinking with your sort of uh, biases, right? Yeah. Uh, addiction goes down. All these things go down. So to me, it's like, well, yeah, I don't care personally, but I think it should be decriminalized because it, it's better for everyone. Um, prostitution, another example. Like, think about if we legalized, regulated, taxed it, got the pimps out, you know, it would be cleaner, it would be safer for people. And people are doing it anyways. It's like making it illegal doesn't stop anything. So decriminalize yeah. it, legalize it. So um, gay marriage is another one of those issues for me. It's like, I'm not a homosexual, but I don't, like, dude, marry the person you love. I don't, it doesn't affect people for shit. Like, why are there people arguing about this? It's like, you're, you don't like gay people? Don't be gay. That's the best thing you can do. Other than that, it's like, what else are you gonna do? It's, it's like a um, uh, I think the issue over here is it's like a religious issue. It's over the definition of marriage. The biblical mm. definition is between man and woman. That's what a lot of people are uh, not too happy about because they say if you get rid of that definition, all hell is gonna break loose. Kind of like I'm not sure. Is it Canada where there's like a million different gender? Genders that people identify themselves no. as? No, no, I don't think so. No. <laughs> so you're like you're thinking about Jordan Peterson. Are you familiar with yeah, that? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. People, people are afraid over here. They're like, we don't want you know these clear, distinct lines to be breached. And but that, they, that was the fear. The, the the funny thing to me is that these clear, distinct lines that we're talking about are are abstract concepts that we invented. Oh yeah. I mean, there, some of them are based on physical realities, like obviously, you know, half the people have penises, the other people, half have vaginas, but that's a really simple distinction. And it's, it's, you know what I mean? There's more subtleties involved. And so we're always trying to hammer these things into these like simplistic boxes, like, well, no, 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 no. Well, with, what, what are we gonna do? We're gonna have four genders, we're gonna have 12. People feel the way they feel. So they're yes. already, in their minds, they're they're different that. gender anyway. So it's like, yeah. whether we accept it or not, it's not a really our problem. It's their problem. Let them be yeah. who they want to be and just fuck off. You know what I mean? <laughs> but, yeah. it, but, it's kind of interesting what you say about um, these simplistic concepts, kind of like how if you get charged for a crime when you're 17, like let's say you kill someone, they mm -hmm. might be like, okay, you're 17, you're underage, we can't give you the death sentence. Mm -hmm. But you turn 18 like a week later, yep, off with your head. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. like, you know what I mean? Like it's, there's like some sort of line, like at 18, someone's able to think critically and yeah. they should be able to, but people are different. Some people come to their own at age 30. Some people much younger. Is yeah. Yeah. You can't fit everybody into simple categories and our efforts to do so just keeps backfiring and creating more problems for us, at least, at least in my opinion. But yeah. Yeah. It's funny. It, it's uh, not the tendency of the human mind to just cling on to simple concepts. That's why everyone wants simple concepts. That's why. That's why it kind of makes me think sometimes. Just what, like seventy? Was it seventy years ago or eighty years ago? We had like the Holocaust, pretty much. We had millions of Jews getting killed, and this idea of like a supreme race. A couple hundred years before that, we had slavery. You know, mm -hmm. like. People are not as evolved as they would like. The sure, the technology is evolved. We've got rockets that go to Mars and stuff. But 
some of the basic shit people can't get their heads around. That's why you have problems like climate change or you know all this crazy shit that's going on right now. You have these huge discrepancies in the world wealth. Like I heard some crazy thing of like how the top one percent owns like eighty percent, some crazy shit like that. Yeah, like very primal. You know, it's, it's like the monkeys wearing suits. Yeah, yeah, we, it really is. Well, and that's something that you mentioned earlier that I, I had the same sort of reaction when I read Seneca. Because here, here's this 2,000-year-old dude, you know, writing letters to his buddy. And, you know, maybe he's talking about the circus or the, the gladiators. But, you know, replace that with the NFL, you know. Yeah. And the exact same shit that he's exactly. talking about that we're going through today. 2,000 years later, we've evolved this much. We have the same problems. And it hit me. There's one letter where he's telling his buddy, like, you know, why did you think that going and traveling around the world was going to help you? you're taking the source of your troubles with you everywhere you go, right? Yeah. And I immediately thought of like five friends of mine who were dead set on moving away to another town to make their, you know, make their big life. And they all ended up coming back. And they all yeah. ended up coming back because it was like, well, you were trying to escape something, but you brought the thing with you. You know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah, it's crazy. We haven't changed. We have technology, you're right. But psychologically where we have not matured or advanced very much in 2000 years, if at all. It's kind of dangerous. It's kind of dangerous now because 2000 years ago, you have an egomaniac, some guy suffering from megalomania. And what happens is they'll have like some war or something and 2000 people would die, you know, in armed combat these days. And who knows what's going to happen in the future. You have one crazy guy presses a button and there's yeah. nuclear, like nuclear war going down and millions of people die. Yeah. So the stakes are much higher. So it's, I think it's more important now than ever that people correct these issues, come to terms with the human, human condition and figure out ways to overcome these tendencies that we naturally have. I think they're natural. I feel like they're natural with some of these tendencies that we have. It's just, it's, it's natural for humans to be engulfed by ego, you know, and to care about themselves. But I feel like a part of life is to find your true self to get rid of the, all these things and yeah yeah well yeah, yeah i think that's definitely a major part of life is discovering your authentic self and mm -hmm. but i mean how many people actually do that i mean like i don't yeah it just seems like it's it's not something that's even on our radar anymore it used to be, I think, through religious uh, traditions and sort of philosophical education, people had a better shot at at least discovering these things and, and mm. making use of them. Whereas now it's not even on our radar. It doesn't get brought up in school. It doesn't get brought up in popular culture, or at least it didn't before. It's starting to now be thanks to people like yourself. But for the most part, it's not something that people are, can find because they don't even know it exists. It's not, it's not even on the map. Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. And I feel like it was easier back then too. If we go back two thousand years ago, it was a guy like Marcus Aurelius or something, who have a lot of time to himself. Like, what do you want to do? Walk around the city, you know, talk to some people, eat something, maybe go to the toilet. And you know, you know, what do you want to do? <laughs> there's no TV, there's no computer. But now you got like social networks, you right. got video games, you got Netflix, you got yeah. comic books, you got all sorts of crazy distractions, and you can just in just saturate yourself and and lose yourself in these distractions to the point where you do that your whole life as new distractions keep coming into your at the point where you can't be distracted anymore when you're near your death and then you're faced with all those hard questions and you go out in a bad place that's why i don't want people to i want people to leave gracefully i think that's why stoicism is such a good philosophy it gives you practical tools to get ready for that day and not let it be a bad thing to reflect on your life and be like, I'm happy with what I lived. I'm content. I did all these things and yeah, I'm ready to, I'm ready to die in peace, die well. Yeah. And that's the thing that I had this thought a while back where I was thinking about like uh, a philosophy of life in order to have a philosophy of life, you have to have a philosophy of death. Like in order to live well, you have to come to grips with death and you have to have a healthy relationship with death. Otherwise it's gonna, I think, create this unconscious tension, right? Like if it's something that you never address, you never consider the fact that um, you will die and it's inevitable. Not only you, but everybody that you know, that you've ever known will eventually die. Just saying it out loud for some people, I think would be, would be hard. 
But the more you contemplate death, the more you realize and you think about it um, and you realize that it's inevitable, I think the more comfortable you are with life and with what you've done and how you should be trying to make the most out of this moment. Because like Marcus is constantly coaching himself, this could be your last day. And it really could, right? I mean, if you had told me that like 10 years ago, I'd have been like, that's depressing. Don't fucking talk to me about that. Now it's like every day I contemplate death at least once where I'm like, one day I'm going to die. Memento Mori. That's, that's, I've, I've got that tattooed, man. I, I, yeah. I believe it's a daily reminder for me now. And I think it forces you to be present because it's like, that's going to happen one day. So I better f fucking do a good job now and make the exactly. most of it. Exactly. Yeah. That, 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 that. That's why I'm such a big advocate of the stoic exercise negative visualization where, you know, things are going good, but you sometimes have to just imagine what if it wasn't so or what if they went bad, which is all within the realms of possibility, of course, and a rainy day will come. But if you've kind of trained yourself to prepare for those things, to be stoic about those things, when it does come, it won't be as bad. Like, it's kind of like what I always tell people, you can feel pain there's a difference between pain and suffering mm -hmm. you can be in pain or like you can not be happy with something but still be at peace yes you know? yeah which is a lot better uh, way better than suffering through some experience yeah so you can have the death of a loved one right of course you cry you're human you have those emotions you moan for them but you won't have that existential dread at the core if you are always entertaining these thoughts, if you're always thinking about it and understand and have a healthy relationship with that, I think that's important. Yeah, I agree. And, and I think that if, if you're more present during life, like, so for instance, my, my wife uh, lost her father a few years back and uh, that was my first sort of direct experience with death. And one of the things that struck me and caught me off guard was her guilt. Like mm. I wasn't a good enough daughter while he was here. I should have been, I should have spent more time with him. Now I'll never get to see him again. And that's that unnecessary suffering that I think can be avoided if you, first of all, perform negative visualization and, and contemplate these sort of eventualities. Mm -hmm. And because that forces you to be present. And so instead of being distracted by all these things, you will spend more time with your father because you're, yeah. you know that you're constantly reminding yourself, Hey, I could never, I could, this could be the last time I ever see him. Like I better yeah. go with him. Right. So it's like a double edged sword. Not only does it make you more present and more fulfilled in the, in the moment, uh, when death does come, as you said, because it will, you're more prepared for it. Yeah. Yeah. Like I think like a healthy way to go out is if you've been present, you've been mindful throughout their lives when they do die, their death, of course, you're going to be sad, as I said before, but it will be a time for you to celebrate, celebrate their life, you mm -hmm. know, like the good times you've had with them. Not so much a time for you to feel guilty about yourself because you have that knowledge that I did all I could, you know, yeah. like I spent my time with them. I was present and this is life. This is nature. They've moved on to whatever plane is next and we'll see what happens. Yeah. When one of the things that I sort of brings me comfort is the fact that really people never really go away. I mean, yeah, their bodies might not be there anymore, but for, you know, for the example of my father-in-law, like I remember him, I, you know, he had an impact in my life. You know, mm. his daughter is a living, breathing, you know, testament of his life and, you know, her siblings and, you know, my in-laws. And so it's like, you know, he's not physically present anymore, but I still see him in my wife and in her relatives. And I still, I even see him in my kids, you know what I'm saying? So yeah. really, you know, people never truly disappear. It's just a transformation. And that's yeah. a good for me anyways, that I like to look at it because it, it brings me a little bit of, of comfort. Well, they lose their corporeal form and I embody it in something else. Yeah. Well, and it's all really, I mean, their, their, their material form is, was always just a, an image in your mind anyway. So, you know, yeah. in a sense, like, you know, you can get deeper, I guess, if you really want to get a little metaphysical, but yeah, <laughs> there's ways to trick the mind into not reacting so strongly and so negatively to certain things that are, um, like you said, naturally fearsome, like death. Like I think yeah. you're, you're as an organism, your number one job is to stay alive. So obviously death is going to be your biggest fear but there's ways to trick the mind into regarding death in a different way or train the mind, I guess. Yeah. Well, I, I think that kind of brings me comfort sometimes when I think about it is I don't think, okay, it's like this. 
there's consciousness, right? When you're awake, walking around, breathing in cheeseburgers. And there's unconsciousness when you're in like that weird, super deep sleep or you're knocked out. Yeah. What happens when you're unconscious? You don't have any recollection, recollection of it, right? Mm -hmm. So assuming that death, no, there's nothing there. You can't have the experience of death. So the only thing that could happen is just wake up to the next experience. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's like, that sounds like straight out of Alan Watts's mouth, my friend. He, I, yeah. I heard, <laughs> I heard him say something very similar once. And it's like, you can't have an experience of no experience. Yeah. So, you Actually, know, people, that's a hundred percent Alan Watts. Yeah. yeah. I love that. That's a great one. Yeah. Well, dude, it's all common property. I mean, but yeah, no, you're, you're totally right. I mean, a lot of people picture death to be with some like dark room and you're there experiencing nothingness. And it's like, no, you don't have an experience of nothing that doesn't yeah. exist. Right. I just think I was like, where did I get that greatness from that? Brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Alan Watts. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> I wasn't trying to call you out, man. I just thought maybe, you know, sometimes no, no. I'll have thoughts. Like sometimes I will have ideas and I don't know, maybe I did get them from somewhere else, but I honestly believe that it's just, um, you know, multiple people can have the same idea independently of each other. So, um, one of the things that I, before I discovered stoicism, I was working in construction and I was doing really shitty intensive labor, like yeah. jackhammering, uh, in a crawl space. So I'm like bent over with a big jackhammer, like with, you know, my back door. And I was, one day I hit like a breaking point and then I, I started asking myself like, what makes one job enjoyable and another job, uh, miserable? And I started to think about it and I was like, really like, it's just how I look at it. And I started thinking about like Jedi mind tricks. You got to look at your job differently. Like you're getting paid to work out, look at it as a workout. And yeah. so even before stoicism, I, I started flirting with this idea. And then like yourself, when I, when I first read Marcus, uh, you know, within pages, it was like, you, it was like coming home. It was like, he was telling yeah. me what I had sort of already felt, but like you said, in a beautiful way and in a sort of more elegant way. So, yeah. um, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm internally grateful for stoicism, to be honest with you, because it's now created this shift in my mind. So where whenever there's something negative that happens, I don't have to kind of just be the victim of that. Mm -hmm. In my mind, it's, it's, it's almost like I can't lose. Everything's a game. Positives are good. Negatives are good because I'm like, yeah, it's a test of my stoicism. <laughs> <laughs> Training time. He's like, oh, let's see how patient I can be. Like, that's yes. my, um mom to the hospital to get checked up and I was waiting in the waiting room with her for like six hours man like it was a long time I was just thinking to myself like I could actually feel my body getting tired and the thoughts coming along it's like oh man it's so boring oh come on can we hurry up and I was like no stoic this is easy I do this for two days <laughs> you actually feel your mind just like changing it's like oh this is like some kind of game now it's like am I gonna let this get to me how can I take this situation and flip it around and make it into a positive so I'm always telling guys, like when they when they come up to me, like, oh, bro, my girlfriend just broke up with me. Oh, you know, like I feel so devastated. I'm like, no, turn this around. This is a gift. This is a gift. Use that energy. Now you've got this surplus of energy that you have never had before. Use that and channel that into something else. Don't look at this as like, this is the end of the world. Yeah, there's always something to gain up almost any negative situation if you look at it the right way. Or if, or if you can't see it right now, you have to have faith in the fact that there's something to gain down the road yeah this um comment of there about this guy he i think it was they made a movie about him like he had his bolt hand stuck between a boulder and he had to chop his own hand off or something and yeah like come on you're chopping your own hand off like what's good about that how can you be stoic about that right but later on down the road after he survived like he wrote a book you know he's doing these public speaking gigs they made a movie so He's made a lot of money from it. His lifestyle is probably a lot better than what it was before when he even had his other hand. So there was something in game with that. Yeah, and I, th I bet you even if none of the other stuff happened afterwards, he would have been so stoked to just be alive, right? I mean, he, he was, was going to fucking exactly. die there. He had to drink his own urine, got to yeah. cut him off with a rusty knife. So, like, like, <laughs> yeah. And so this is another thing that I wanted to ask you about, your thoughts on this sort of um, – Alan Watts calls it the law of reversed effort. So he says, like, for example, if you try to hold on to your breath, you're going to lose your breath, right? If you're in water and you try to grab the water, you're going to sink. But if you just let yeah. go, you're going to flow, right? So it's like sometimes you have to get what you want. You have to do the opposite of what you think you need to do. Mm -hmm. And so this guy cut his own hand off, survived, probably was just super stoked to be alive. And because he just was happy to be alive, the universe was like, have a book deal. 
you know, yeah. some motivational speaking. And yeah. he's the right person to get it because he really appreciates it. I bet you anything after you came this close to dying, you're going to appreciate everything. So exactly, it's like when you stop chasing it, it finds you. You know what I mean? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Sometimes you have to be put in this situations to actually appreciate it. It reminds me of this um, scene in the movie Fight Club when um, Tyler Dern pulls out a gun on some shop clerk. And then um, asks him, like, what are your goals? You know, what are your dreams? And the guy tells him his dreams is like, you better do it by tomorrow. I'm going to kill you. And then he like, yeah. that's the guy. He's like, oh, why'd you, why'd you let him do that? He's like, tomorrow he's going to enjoy his bread like so that's much. Right. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. that's right. <laughs> Breakfast will never be so sweet as it will be exactly. tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. That movie and that book, man, that's some subversive shit. Like that that book, that like that whole like, that whole story still stands the test of time to me. Like I've watched it so many times and every time it's like, holy shit, this guy was onto something. <laughs> that book, um um yeah, Fight Club and the Mate I like the Matrix series as well. That, I feel mm-hmm. like that's very deep. Mm-hmm. Um, those two are great. Yeah, it's funny too. Like I've noticed um, from studying Joseph Campbell and the the hero's journey, the monomyth, I yeah. found that kids' movies, a lot of kids' movies, have these hidden messages, these hidden themes. Um, <laughs> even one that's like the Lego Movie. Have you ever seen that one? No, no, I haven't seen it. The original Lego Movie. It's like I don't want to call it a kids' movie because it's ridiculous. It's hilarious. <laughs> it's so funny, and there's so many adult jokes in it, but. Ultimately, like if you watch the Lego movie, it's the Matrix. It's like the same, oh. same, same story, right? And or like yeah. um, the original Star Wars trilogy, right? The the yeah. lowly farm boy who's the the chosen one, right? Like mm-hmm. the Luke Skywalker. It's always the same motif. It's always the same idea. Like Mr. Anderson working in his cubicle, and then he ends up being the cho- you know. There's a moment where you're told, no, actually, you're not the chosen one. And then as soon as they mm-hmm. stop caring, that's when they become the chosen one. You know what yeah. I mean? And it's yeah, the same like, idea. It's the reversed effort. It's like as soon as you stop caring about that shit, it comes to you. You got to just let go and just focus on the other stuff, right? Yeah. I, I got a question for you. Um, what are your thoughts on – this is a thing that comes up in self-improvement books a lot of the time – the law of attraction. Well, well, I think that's kind of what we're talking about in a way because it, mm-hmm. you're you, you do attract things, but it's not always it's not always by straightforward means. like. Mm-hmm a lot of these things ensue like happiness. If you chase happiness, you're going to be forever unhappy. So you have to make the right conditions for happiness. And so once you have the right conditions, you will attract happiness. It's to me, that's kind of what the law of attraction is. Um, and then the, the other side of that is affirmations and auto suggestion. I mean, if you're constantly reaffirming things in your head, constantly visualizing things, then you, of course you're going to attract those types of things and you're going to, Uh, unconsciously make decisions that are better for that sort of uh, that situation or circumstance or whatever it is that you're visualizing. Um, But I don't think that it's like a matter of like visualize your parking spot and it's going to be open for you. (laughs) You know, the the secret, that documentary, like I watched that and I was like, that's such bullshit. Like there's a a truth there. There's a truth there, but then they took it and they just wrapped it in bullshit. Yeah. They took it and they made it something you know, that you can market and sell to people. It's exactly. Quick fix, quick fix solution. Yeah, write out your $1 million check and look at it every morning and you'll be a millionaire in a, in a week or whatever. And it's like, and to me, that that sort of t- spoils it right away because the fact that people are trying to teach you how to use this to make money is like, you're corrupting it. The, the money is a byproduct, just like the happiness and all that stuff. So, um, but what are your thoughts on it, actually? Yeah, like, I, I 100% agree with you because I saw I was initially like put off it because of the book and you know the usual like oh I wrote this check for two billion dollars and I got it because I started thinking about it I'm like nah man but what I have noticed is like in life generally when you do get in certain frequencies when you're like kind of let go of things strange things start happening you know like by chance you meet the right people i have noticed that does happen a lot yeah. of times so i believe there is some truth in it but not in the way that they depict in the movie where you get the exact thing that you want like the exact like you might not get a million dollars but so why did you want the million dollars to begin with maybe to have happiness but you mm. might get the happiness you know so yeah yeah that's yeah. how i feel as well um you know carl jung calls them synchronicities 
Mm-hmm. Like they're, they're like these coincidences that are just like, how, how could it possibly happen? Right. Like, like you said, it's kind of like when you're thinking about someone you haven't seen in 10 years and then you meet them, ah. you know what I mean? like that sort of stuff. I think that's kind of what the law of attraction is trying to describe is this sort of, um, you do, I mean, I don't know about vibrations and stuff, but I feel like you do kind of attract and, and you have energy and you do kind of attract things. Right. So. Well, the thing that I've been looking at lately is, um, people, like these illnesses that people get, like people actually getting cancer and stuff from stressing from their mm. thoughts. Like your mind can affect your body at a very real level. And I never really um, thought about that, but I've been reading these books, like this book that my girlfriend recommended to me called um, the, the Habit of Being Yourself or something like that mm. by Joe, what's his name? Joe something or other. Joe Dispenza. Mm. I've got another book of his here. I'm the placebo. It's like, I'm breaking the habit of being yourself. And he's talking about like all this research about people that stressed out and then it releases like certain chemicals into your body, changes like your genetics or your DNA. And then you can actually get these diseases. And I've analyzed a lot of people in life that are always complaining, always down in a negative, you know, mindset. And these people tend to have these illnesses I've noticed as well. And I'm not saying this is the root cause of all illnesses. I mean, some things are just genetic, some things you yeah. just get whatever, right? But I feel like you can't, your mind has a bigger part to play in your health and a lot of these things more so than what a lot of people think about. So that kind of got me more into this mission about the mind because it's just so, so important. Yeah. Well, like you, you meditate, you've mentioned it already. Uh, Obviously you've probably heard about some of the benefits of meditation, physical health benefits. So that right there is proof positive that by tinkering with your mind, it has a very real effect on your body and your health. Um, and the title of that book you pulled down, Placebo, I mean, that's another, uh, another thing. You believe that you're getting the cure. Therefore, your body goes, let's cure this motherfucker, and you're, you're cured. It's like you got a sugar pill, dummy. Like you believed it so hard that you cured yourself. You know, like that's the mind, right? It kind of makes sense, though, because if you think about it, like your subconscious mind, it's responsible for all these things like your heart beating, you know, like regulating your body's temperature, this crazy intelligence that you have no part to play in, right? Yeah. So if you can somehow get to be on your side, your body's already got all the things to fix whatever illness you have. It just needs to fix them. Yeah. Like all these pills and stuff, they just kind of help and facilitate the environment for your body to do the rest of the work. When you get a cut on your arm, it's your body that repairs you, right? Right. So it's definitely the mind that has a part. So if your conscious mind is somehow influencing your subconscious mind, through the things that you say, creating an environment that's not the best, then yeah. it will impede recovery. Absolutely. Yeah, and it makes perfect sense, I think, yeah, especially when you have some understanding of uh, the unconscious mind, which uh, this is something I want to commend you on because I think it would be very easy for you to just stick to stoicism and to just your bread and butter make videos and you you know the material very well, but I see that you keep branching out and, and widening the circle and you're making videos about things that you – discovering so you're you're always looking for new things it seems yeah yeah i feel i feel like it's not it's not a good idea to stick to one thing and get one perspective because yeah sure i could just read a bunch of stories and stuff and become like some of these zealots for stoicism <laughs> you know, <something> like <laughs> don't get me started don't get me started <laughs> ones that like, like so no that's wrong he said this in the discourse line seven you know they i'm like come on bro like <laughs> Don't you worship Zeus, Isaac? Yeah. It's like, no, Stoic would never do that. The yeah. Stoic would never do that. You That's know? right. <laughs> yes. Hey, yes. the best is on Reddit when you have these, like, our Stoicism questions. Like, what, what if, I'm, if I'm a Stoic, am I allowed to masturbate? Like, <laughs> is that your fucking pressing question right now? You're not a Stoic. There, let me answer it for you right away. You're not a Stoic. Yeah, yeah. I, I never want to kind of put myself in one category. So I'm always trying to read different things. So like in my search, I've looked at stoicism. I've looked at different philosophies. I've looked at like neuro-linguistic programming. Like some people don't look at that because like that's pseudoscience. We don't want to, you know, so, no, I don't care. Like I want to see if it's helped some people, I want to look at it. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy, like anything, you know, like Sigmund Freud, anything that I can yeah. find that deals with the mind and self-improvement that level. Uh, I want to look at because the whole vibe of my channel is called psychological warfare, dominate your life with psychological warfare, actualization without the bullshit. Because 
a lot of the self-improvement stuff is just watered down, feel good bullshit. I want to get to the core of it. Say some things that some people might not like, you know, mm -hmm. and, but that's going to help them in the long term if they actually listen to it and take it a hold. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, something that I've been thinking about a lot lately is like self, self-help. The, the whole title and the whole industry, it seems like it's a bit of a bullshit industry, right? Because yeah. like, it's been around for a couple, you know, I think 150 years and it nets billions of dollars a year. But if it was doing its job, it wouldn't exist anymore because people would have gotten the help they need. You know what I mean? So yeah. I've, been, I've been joking around with people that I think it should be called do it yourself help because it's like, you can read the book, you can agree with it and you can think it's the best thing in the world, but you have to do it yourself. Yeah. That, that's very important. The action bit is what a lot of people lack. A lot of people kind of want to get the high of learning a new concept, reading about it, going to a seminar again, you know, jacked up at the Tony Robbins seminar and whatever and feeling good. But when it comes to actually doing it, that's when they forget all about it. They go on these like meditation retreats and they meditate for 10 days and they feel great. They do the compassion meditation. But as soon as they get back home, they're like yelling at their husband or their wife, you know, like yeah. that's the playing field. That's, that's a stadium when you're living and you have to actually do it. That's where the real stuff help happens. That's when you actually learn the stuff and people don't seem to understand that. And I feel like that's why the self-help industry is really big because they're all, it's, it's kind of like they give you the book, you try it out, it works for a bit, it doesn't work, but you remember that worked for a little bit. So that kind of gives you an incentive to get the next book. So hopefully that one will work a little bit longer, works for a little bit, get the next one, keep coming back and yeah. Yeah, it's like a scam basically. They just, they get you hooked. <laughs> much just like the supplement industry for the most part it's a bullshit industry is it well tell, <laughs> tell me more tell me more about that because that sounds interesting to me my uh, wife my wife uh, my wife is uh like my wife has uh, become a bit of a fitness junkie in the last probably i would say year and for a while she was taking a lot of protein and i was uh, like and I, I kept telling her, like, because I remember way back in the day, I worked out with this guy, and he was a bodybuilder, and he was like, dude, don't take that shit. He's like, you get enough, more than enough protein in just your regular diet. He's like, if you eat, like, a chicken breast, you got enough protein, like, for, for the day, right? And this guy was yoked. So yeah. what, what, what are some of the supplements that are that you think are bullshit, just so I can well, know not I, to buy them? <laughs> like, 99% of them. Like, the thing is, like, for example, whey protein, that's like a byproduct of milk, right? And <laughs> they give it to you. Because if you look on the cake, like the cover of a typical whey protein bottle, it'll have some big jacked up bodybuilder, right? All these bodybuilders, or 99% of them, that are jacked up, these crazy delts, crazy Hulk looking things, they're on steroids. Yeah. They're going to tell you they're on steroids. They're going to tell you that it's the protein, that you buy the protein. <laughs> if you actually observe anyone that goes to the gym, lifts, has a proper diet, almost no one ever looks like that. Like yeah. no one that has a legit, no one ever looks like that. If you look at a healthy male, almost no healthy male ever has like some rippled APAC abs with veins. That does not happen. No. It's all about taking these extra things, these extra hormones and stuff. But the, the catch is they can't tell you they're taking those things because those things are illegal. And if they told you they were taking those things, you wouldn't buy the products. Right. So they play off the ignorance of people that, because people don't research these things. It's, it's you know, like it's kind of hard to find information. Mm -hmm. And they make you believe that you need the fat burner, the hydroxy card or whatever. You need the creatine. You need the, when 99% of this shit is not even backed up by any scientific evidence to work. Interesting. So even like, uh, like uh, what, what's uh, creatine monohydrate? Like the, the creatine does have scientific evidence, but from my personal experience, it didn't really do much. Like, mm. The only time creatine's ever worked for me is when I took it as part of like some crazy like pre workout NO explode. And you take, oh, like, God, oh. you take like one scoop and it's like, you have to work out now, Isaac, because if you sit there, you're going to have a heart attack. You have to go to the gym now. <laughs> I used to be addicted to pre workouts for a little bit. And um, yeah, my, my girlfriend got me off those. So. <laughs> yeah, oh, good. Yeah. Well, dude, like for all, for, for all the negative health impacts, I remember I did it for probably about six months and I it definitely worked, but again, what was in it? And now they're not allowed to sell it in Canada anymore. So I'm assuming yeah. that it was, wasn't good shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sometimes they put some um, amphetamines in there and stuff. Cause the, the supplement industry is not really regulated properly. Like the food industry is. Yeah. So they put all kinds of weird shit in there. Like some of them have actually put steroids in there, like, like pro hormones and stuff. 
and then people would be getting jacked up and like you know like huge and then eventually they're like nah we can't sell this and then yeah they're sold behind the counter <laughs> and then there's some angry jacked up guy at the supplement store saying where's my nl explode yeah. i need it I, I, i've actually tried the nl explode stuff oh. oh have you yeah yeah, it was, uh, there were a few times where I did it where I was like, I'd be on the treadmill warming up and I'd get really queasy and I'd be like, oh shit, am I going to throw up? Like right now, this is, this is, is this where I'm at now in life? Like, this is how important it is for me to get jacked. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I feel like it's the mind to be honest with you still. Because with, with the pre-workouts, the main ingredient that actually works is just the caffeine. Yeah. So just drink a coffee. If you just drink a coffee, like a strong coffee, you have like the same effect. But they put these yeah. other things that like beta alanine, which makes you itchy. That's right. So when you feel the itchiness, you're thinking, God damn, this thing is working. You know, like, I'm, <laughs> I'm feeling itchy. So your, your mind's like, I'm on this stuff. You know, I'm feeling itchy. I got to yeah. go hard. And you do go hard. It's placebo. No, as opposed man. to what we double, you know? Like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And you're, I, I can totally see that being the case. Yeah. Like you said, the supplement industry, like, they're not very regulated and they're pretty shady, so. Now, but it's funny that you say the the thing about the steroids in there because like it's happened quite a few times in the um, I don't know if you watch like mixed martial arts at all but ah, yes, tainted GFT. supplements right like oh I tested positive for steroids it must have been tainted supplements yeah. like my whey protein had you know human growth hormone in it or something yeah. the John Jones excuse yeah 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 exactly yeah oh there must have been steroids in my cocaine right <laughs> That guy, that guy, man. The only person who can beat John Jones is John Jones. He's his own worst enemy. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, he, I was actually a big fan of his, but sad to see that he you know, took the party lifestyle that he steroids a bit too much. And Yeah, I was a fan of his as well, especially when he was coming up. I thought, you know, I had a lot of, I loved watching him because like he was doing crazy shit, like spinning back elbows out of the clinch. And like, he was just ragdolling people. Like they were little children, like 205 pound guys. And he would just fucking throw them across. Like he was amazing. And then he just, yeah, again, you keep saying it, it comes back down to the mind, Isaac. Mm -hmm. John's yeah. problem is his mind, right? I mean, he, he, um, he was on a podcast and he was saying before every big fight, he used to go out on a bender and do uh, yeah. because then it would give him an excuse in case he lost. So it, it's all insecurity, ego, doubt, eating up mm -hmm. at him and, and everything that he does, all these mistakes are a result of that, I think. Yeah. Some, some people have um, w w what they call self-fulfilling prophecies. Yeah. And I used to have them as well, especially for exams. I'm, I still just don't remember. I used to always be the guy that would help people before the exam and like, I'll know my shit. Like I really know my stuff and people would be coming to me, but come the exam, I would just blank out and just freak out and have some mm -hmm. nervous breakdown and just couldn't do it. And I would like do really bad. And they'll come up to me afterwards, but like, Oh bro, how'd you do it? And I'll do worse than the people I was teaching. Right. Mm -hmm. So this happened a few times and it got to the point where it just kept happening because what happened now is my mind was primed for that. Like I was conditioned to, Think that was going to happen so i'll go into the exam and i'll literally make myself make these mistakes my brain will no longer work just so i could stay congruent with this idea my ego now ahead of me it's like oh i fuck up during the exams right and once i started working on that like with all this work once i got rid of that i started doing well in the exams so the self-fulfilling prophecy is definitely a real thing it's, the mind is i don't know <laughs> can't stress it enough yeah it's so crazy right yeah you know i I think that's pretty common. Like, so what, for you, was it like pr the pressure of, of it being a test? Like when there was nothing on the line, you were crushing it. And then as soon as it was like, it's official, I have to do well. It was like the pressure would just get to you. Yeah. The pressure would get to me. But the thing that made it worse was the memories of me messing up in previous tests. So <laughs> at some level, my mind's like, Oh, you're gonna mess up again. Oh, you're gonna mess up again. Oh, you're gonna do it again. You know? You're a scumbag, and, eh? and once you get in that frequency or that, mode of thinking that is what happens you kind of a law of attraction thing again <laughs> you know you're asking for it yeah so, so how did you get over that what was did you uh, was that part of sort of your your mental training that you've been working on or i got over it by meditation so like instead of focusing on messing up in the exam before the exam i would think about me kicking ass or like the strategy i would take into the exam and i would like right before the test went like as soon as they said okay time you can start right now I'll take like a couple of deep breaths right before the test, just get my mind in that 
safe zone, you know, just kind of like chill out a bit to look at it and have a more strategic approach, slow things down a lot. And once I did that and started having a more strategic approach, answering the questions I could, slowing things down, my results just like went way up as opposed to freaking out. Going, oh, because another thing that bothered me is like, I would make these exams like life or death. So, oh, if I mess this exam up, it's going to be the end of me. It's going to be the end of me. But when you start meditating and you start, you know, considering that, there's more to life than results, than a degree, than the job or all these things. Once you stop putting so much value into those things, they're just concepts like, you know, like what you said, they're just concepts. Yep. It doesn't really, like, you know, what? I'm going to do the best I can do now. Even if I fail, it doesn't matter. It's the same with um, the results too. Waiting for the results used to bother me so much. I would be thinking about 24-7, rule my day for two weeks, three weeks until the results came out. And I remember like my heart racing and I look at my results, but oh crap, oh, oh good, I passed, you know. Whereas now, like I recently had my exams, I literally haven't even thought about it since then. Like, I just, That's awesome. I, I do it, I forget about it, I look at the results, I, did I do good, sweet, I did bad, oh, I'll do it again next year, or oh, I'll drop yeah. it, you know. There's no, there's no threat to myself, you know, there's, I don't get harmed from it. And that's the good thing about it. Yeah, so it's almost like you derive your own uh, sense of value, self-worth from something else that's not external. Yeah. It's not, at least exactly. it's not exams, right? Exactly, which is a big problem for a lot of people. They derive their sense of worth from their job, or the, the, you know, like the, the wife they have or the kids they have, the town they're born in. It's always something that they attach themselves to. And if they lose that thing, they get divorced. Their ego is shattered because it, that, it was part of that concept. That's right. So, yeah that's crazy man well i'm glad that you're doing so well i'm glad that you've gotten over some of these uh these little like hurdles that you're telling me here I, i've had lots of similar ones man uh yeah like for me writing was a big one i used to have lots of problems with writer's block and i would like mm -hmm. basically since 2013 like i've been a lot happier and more peaceful and more uh, at ease with who i am but basically like everything stopped affecting me except writer's block. And then because I was trying to write books about what we're talking about today, and I felt like I had something that I had to give back, I had to share these ideas with people, I put a lot of pressure on myself and it kept coming out wrong. And then it became the biggest source of my misery. And I used to joke with people, I'd be like, I'm trying to write a book about happiness and it's the biggest source of unhappiness in my life. Um, and I recently kind of got over that as well. So it's, it's nice to hear that other people have had similar struggles and you're able to overcome your, your sort of, uh, your hangups there. That's awesome. Yeah. It, it takes time, but eventually you, uh, get over them if you look in deep enough and see what exactly the root cause is. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. And, and I think, you know, this is something that maybe we'll save for another conversation, but I'll be interested to get your thoughts about, I don't even know how to describe it. I feel like a lot of people, when you talk about looking within, they don't really understand what that means. And so like for me, I was, I'm an only child. So I've spent a lot of time in my head. I'm a naturally introspective person. So I've, I'm familiar with within here because I spent a lot of time in there. But for people who have lived almost exclusively in an external facing way, introspection, reflection, exploring the psyche, if you will, these are foreign concepts. So is this something that you just were just kind of naturally able to do or is it something that you achieved through a particular practice? Um, I was never able to do it besides through meditation. Before that, I never did it. I never really questioned how I acted, never really questioned my beliefs. But when you start meditating, that's the funny thing. When, when you're meditating, a lot of people think that the magic happens just when you're meditating. Not always. When you're meditating for the first time, it's hell on earth. You're like, what the hell is this? Like, it's so boring. Like, I can't focus, what's going on? But the byproduct of that meditation lingers on throughout your day and throughout other times. You just have these random moments of just silence. You know, you're just sitting, standing there like waiting for something, you just like chill. And when you analyze these thoughts, you now have the silence, you now have the magnifying glass to analyze thoughts that you perhaps just kind of accepted previously. Mm -hmm. as just, you know, this is my mind. And that's when the introspection begins. It's like, because you, you look at that thought and you think, oh, why, why am I having that thought? And then you have another thought. It's like, wait, if I can analyze this thought, am I this thought? Or like, you know, it just, there's layers and layers. It's just layers and layers of it. And it just builds up and you can decide to disregard certain things. You don't put so much value onto 
thoughts that come into your mind, not everything that comes into your mind is yours. Whereas previously, everything that came into your mind is yours and that creates the pathway to change, I mm. believe. So like when you say meditation, because I think that word can mean a lot of things to different people, uh, is there a specific kind of meditation that you started with just out of curiosity? Uh, yeah, to begin with, I just started, um, it was actually interesting. I used to just sit down on this chair and just look at the moon. <laughs> And that's it. I just look at the moon and try focus on that and try look at it without looking at it and giving it a judgment like this is the moon or giving it a word moon. I just looked at it for what it was, try to see the essence of it. Right. And while while I was doing that, it kind of quieted down my mind a little bit or put me in this different state where I could actually pay attention to my thoughts. Right. And be like, oh, okay. And then I stopped doing that and started doing more um, mindfulness type meditation where I would just pay attention to everything, like the feelings, the sensations, the thoughts. Mm -hmm. And I, I like that meditation more because um, you can do it anywhere. Like, yeah. I feel like sitting down is good because it creates a really good environment for you to um, remove distractions. But if you really want to get good at living, you have to incorporate that into life. So as you're walking around, just feeling the ground underneath your feet, Mm. As you're like talking to someone, just being fully present to the conversation, listening to what they have to say, you know, like, I feel like that's the most important meditation because that's going to directly help you quicker into life. Right. Yeah. No, that's interesting. I like that because I, I think a lot of people are under the impression that in order to meditate, you have to sit cross-legged, uh, hold your fingers like this, you know, like what you're describing is a lot more similar to what I would consider meditation, which is on the, on this, on the job meditation, like yeah. the grocery store lineup, the till is you pick the worst till it's like super slow. There's mm -hmm. an opportunity to meditate right there. You know what I mean? Exactly. Um, exactly. And by directing your senses into different things, like you said, the ground beneath your feet or things that you never notice normally. Like when you're drinking yeah. water, pay attention to that feeling of the water going down your esophagus and follow it as far as it goes. Like simple things like that to draw your attention to things that you normally don't notice. Um, yeah. it, it, that's how you start, eh? Hmm. Even at work, um, I remember I used to do this boring ass job where I'd stack shelves and super repetitive, but I, it's all being bored about it and being this depressed state, I thought, you know what? I'm going to use this as a chance to meditate. I'm going to like be a hundred percent conscious with every single movement I do. Like pick this up in a particular way, put it on the shelf and pick this up, put it on the shelf. Like every single motion was just super, like a lot of awareness in it. And the funny thing happened is, well, the funny thing that happened was it started becoming more enjoyable. Yeah. Because it's almost like a game. You're just like paying attention. It's like, how present can I get? Or sometimes when I'm um, sitting down and meditating, I do this thing where I try to listen, right? And I try see how far my hearing can go. So like try to pick up on the faintest noise and see like what exactly is there. And what you do notice when you're doing this mindfulness type stuff is there's so much that happens in life that you just forget because throughout the day you're stuck in your head thinking about you know tomorrow or worrying about yesterday. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's awesome, man. Great stuff. That's awesome. Uh, okay, one last thing before we go, Isaac. Yeah. What's one idea or concept that you've picked up over the years that if you could only share one thing with everybody? Oh, damn. That's all. <laughs> well, or, you know, like, I won't put that much pressure on you. Let's say, like, one of three things. This is the one of the three things or, you know, some of the top ones, like. Well, I think one of the most important ones definitely is your perception is everything. How you perceive events, how you perceive your thoughts. There's no, like, how you react can... No, I don't know what you're saying. <laughs> your perception is everything. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> I think that pretty much covers it, dude. Yeah, just like... <laughs> I explain this. <laughs> uh, no, I well, dude, you don't have to explain it to me. I agree with you. I mean, that's yeah. that's definitely a big one. Like perspective is reality, right? I mean, how, what you perceive yeah. is, is your reality. There, you'll never know another reality, or at least not until you ditch the meat suit. So. Exactly, because like what we were talking before, you could be in the best best circumstance ever: rich, money, comfort, status, everything, and you can still decide to kill yourself. Yeah. And it happens all the time. Why, why do people do that? It's perception. 
Yes. Yeah. Events are happening, but they're choosing to perceive them in a particular type of way. And you can be in the complete opposite. Although it's harder to take a positive onlook, it is possible to actually be a lot happier than someone who has better things or is in a better circumstance than you. So perception is everything. If you go from there, I feel like you'd be in a really good spot. Nice. Nice. Well, that's a great way to close it off, Isaac. Thanks yeah. a lot for this chat, man. That was awesome. Happy you, man. It's been great. So I'm going to plug your, uh, the, the YouTube channel and the website. Is there anything else you want me to plug in the comments uh, down below? I guess because it's no, a bit no, that'll be it. Just the, the YouTube. You can catch me on the YouTube making daily videos at the moment. And yeah. Awesome, dude. Keep up the good work, man. We'll do this again. This was awesome. Of course. I got lots more questions for you. <laughs> <laughs> Too easy. Too easy. All right, brother. So this is the end of the video. You must have really liked it if you got this far. Yeah, I'm right. Yeah, I'm right. Okay. If you liked it, please click subscribe and hit the post notifications because YouTube is doing this weird thing right now where if you subscribe, it doesn't even show you my videos. Very strange, very strange stuff. But yeah, click those post notifications. Well, good. Till next time.